advent calendars, everybody. If you haven't picked yours up yet, uh, grab one in the lobby before you leave, even though we're already into December. The good news, we're only on the 12th, so you got plenty of time uh, to still have some fun with your family. Uh, we made these advent cards for you, these calendars, so that you'd have something to do to celebrate with your family every day throughout this series. So, the series, what are we doing? Well, we're doing Advent. And uh, again, this is very new for us at Grace Life. We have never done Advent series for Christmas, but some churches do it every single year. I grew up in a church that did it every year, so for some of us, very new. For others of us, it's a tradition. And the whole point is to take the four Sundays that lead up to Christmas and to help us prepare our hearts and minds for Jesus coming because, uh, look, Christmas is not about gifts. It's not about meals. It's not about all of the, I, I'm, I hope you have great things. I hope you get a good present. I hope you spend time with your family, but that's not what it's about. And so what we do is we take these, these four weeks, we have four themes where we are trying to understand something that Jesus did where our life is actually different because he came. You guys, you guys understand what I'm saying? Like we're not just like, yay, Jesus, he came and forget about it. It's like, wait a minute, what changes in my life today because Jesus came? And so what we are using for our theme this year are four words that are very common to Christmas. Uh, I've been calling them Christmas card words uh, for our series, uh, meaning you, you'll get a card in the mail that'll have one of these, these words that we see at Christmas. It's not a, a, a birthday card. It's not a graduation card that says congratulations, but it's words like peace and hope and love, and faith, and joy, and, and maybe a couple of others. But the idea is that these words represent something in our lives that may be very different from what we're experiencing, right? You guys with me? But here's the problem. We don't always feel that way. Matter of fact, you may get a Christmas card that says peace. And uh, just because you got the card and you're having a rather chaotic day, do you suddenly just go, oh, well, thank you for the card. Now I am totally good. Or you're a little angry at something and you get one that says joy and you go, oh, well, I am suddenly happy. So what we've discovered is the Christmas cards themselves might be a little hollow at achieving the purpose. But if we can understand what these words really mean, then hopefully they will not be hollow to us as we understand what Jesus came to do. So one of the traditions that goes with Advent is that we light a candle each week to represent our theme and the word that we've been doing. So we began the series with peace. And we, we, come up, we came up with a definition that we're adapting each week by changing just one word. We started with understanding that peace is an internal calmness despite external circumstances. I mean, it doesn't matter what's going on around us. Matter of fact, our lives could be incredibly chaotic at the moment. But because of who Jesus is and what he did for us, there is peace on the inside. Something in us that is different from what's going on around us. You guys following that? Okay, if you missed that one on peace, go back and get it it's online. Uh, last week, we talked about joy and how joy is an internal happiness despite external circumstances, meaning there is something inside of us that is so satisfied and content in the best way possible with life that we can have joy even when our circumstances are a little bit different from that. So look, I, I hope you've noticed the theme. I've tried to make it very, very obvious, and I'm not talking about the Advent calendars or the candles. I'm talking about the theme that what Jesus is doing inside of us is different from what's going on around us. And so today, one more, we're talking about hope. And hope is an internal confidence despite what is going on around us. Now look, I, I know one thing to be true. Every person in this room, every person worshiping online with us has hoped for something they didn't get, right? Right? And then it was a, a bit disappointing. We weren't really sure how to process that. And matter of fact, at some point, we weren't even sure if we wanted to hope for something in the future. It began to, to damage our, our idea there. And, and the Bible even talks about this. Proverbs says that hope deferred, meaning a hope that is unfulfilled, actually makes the heart sick. Meaning we're, we're supposed to, to, to want things that we hope for to actually become real, that when, when they're not, that, that it's going to impact us and it's going to leave, leave a mark. And, and the problem that we have is because we understand hope a little differently from what the Bible means. Matter of fact, uh, if you go and look it up in an English dictionary, a synonym for hope is wish. You, you just wish you'd get something. But the problem is our God is not a genie, right? 
And, and so look, let me, let me try to make this practical for you. Uh, imagine two USC South Carolina fans, right? Make sure we're in the same state. Two South Carolina fans talking to each other about their chances of winning right before the Alabama game. And they may, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I want y'all to be able to listen to me, so I'm not going to go any further with that one. Let, let me give you an illustration from my life. I'm a Duke fan, and uh, some of you still love me despite that. But the truth is, most of you don't really care. And that's why I'm going to use Duke as an illustration, because it's far enough removed from your Clemson, South Carolina reality, okay? But uh, basketball season is back in full swing, and I'm excited about that. And uh, Duke has a good team this year, so I'm excited about that, because uh, we've had a whole lot of lost hope over the years. You know, we've been getting these really good players and we never bring home a championship, but that's not really part of the sermon. But, but here it is. Over Thanksgiving weekend, Duke being one of the top five teams in the nation was going to play one of the other top five teams in the nation. And, and I, was, I was excited. I was looking forward to this all, all since the season started. Just like, man, this is going to be a great game. It was on the West Coast, so I took a little nap in the day so that I could start the game at like 10, 30 p.m. or whatever it was because I wanted to be excited. I wanted to be energized. I was ready for this thing. But here's the, the problem with two top five teams playing each other. You don't know who's going to win. I mean, I hoped Duke would win. And what I mean is I wish they would win. I wanted them to win. But it's two top five teams. You really can't know how that's going to go, right? I mean, that could be either way. So at the end of the day, all I knew is we had a 50-50 chance of actually winning this game. That's how it worked when you got two teams. For those of you who didn't do well in math class, 50-50 <laughs> chance right there, right? But here's what I want you to know. Jesus did not come to give you a wish and a 50-50 chance at anything. Right. Somebody with me? Right. Jesus came to give us hope that is real, no matter what you see around you. And so that's the hope that I want us to see today. And as we get ready to jump into Scripture, I want to explain a little bit about the word hope in Scripture. Anybody decorated for Christmas yet? Good, good. Glad for that. Now, how many of you, when you went to decorate for Christmas, you reached into the box to pull out a strand of lights and you got a knot of lights, and they were all tied together, and they were, I see heads nodding already. Some of you got a tear coming. Y'all going to get some healing over that. And, and, and you couldn't get them apart, so you finally just threw them back in the box, and then you went to Target and bought new ones. Anybody who's with me, right? There you go. Okay. So here's the thing. The ideas of hope, when you use the word hope, the ideas that the Bible brings together is like those knotted strands. There are at least four strands of lights that make up that knot. Every time you see the word hope in the Bible, there's four concepts that are supposed to all be involved. One of them is waiting. One of them is expectation. One of them is trust. And one of them is confidence. And here's the problem with those four words. We don't like them because <laughs> all four of those words represent our complete lack of control in a situation. Did y'all follow that? We, we wait when we don't have control. You ever been to Walmart, go Christmas shopping, and you're waiting in line. You know why you're waiting? Because they've got 30 other registers they don't even have open. And if you were in control, you would have them open. Somebody would be there. I wouldn't have to wait. But I have to wait because I am not in control of how Walmart runs a store. We expect something that has to come because I, I don't control whether or not it comes. I have to trust somebody else to do what they said they will do because I can't control whether or not they do it. We hate these words. Because we're not in control. But check this out. Romans chapter 8 says, Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? You don't use that word. If it's in your hands, you don't go, Look at what I'm hoping for. No, no, that's not the word you use anymore. You hope for what you can't see, what is not there. It says, for what, If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. You see all of those words right there coming together? Again, expectation, waiting, trust, confidence. Now, here's the thing. If we've got to hope for something we don't have, if we've got to wait for something we can't see, something we want to come, where in the world do we get internal confidence? That seems like a total contradiction, doesn't it? It comes from God. Because if we keep reading the passage, here's what it says. And we know, do you all know? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. We know. But do we? I mean, that really is kind of the question there. And see, that's why this is an Advent theme. Because we should know. And we can know. We can know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. Because he already did. His name is Jesus. Come on, somebody with me? Yeah. Right? See, here's the thing. God promised for millennia 
Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, God promised that he was going to save his people. He was going to send a savior. Uh, we use the word Messiah. And the problem for God's people is they couldn't be their own savior. They couldn't create their own savior. They didn't even understand what they needed saving from. Matter of fact, all they were looking forward to was some kind of national hero. Somebody who was going to come and fix their, their worldly problems, their political problems. They were going to get Rome to leave them alone and make Israel great again. It was just going to be a circumstantial problem solver. Somebody who was going to do that. Well, it's like you and me. We go and vote every four years for somebody who promises they're going to solve everything that's been wrong for the last four, and they're going to make it all right. And God comes along and says, I hate to tell you, but I'm going to give you something so much better than a president. I'm going to give you something that solves problems you don't even know you have, because here's the reality. You have no idea how separated from me you are. You have no idea. There's a, there's a reality of heaven. There's a reality of hell, and some of you are not headed the right direction. So look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send the Savior, and he is going to die for your sins. He's going to rescue you. He's going to make you right with me. He's going to give you an eternal future, and God did exactly what he said he was going to do. It's why we were just singing this song, Jesus, my living hope. And, and we were singing things like uh, the chains are broken. You know what that means? If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then the power of sin is broken over your life. You don't have to struggle and endure and, and to deal with the things that you used to do. It says death has no grip on me anymore. There was a day when you were going to die and it was going to be the end. But now when we die, it's only the beginning of eternity and everything being made right. And, and that's why Jesus is our living hope. Look, here's the deal. God has always delivered his people. That's where our hope comes from is because of God's proven past. You guys follow me here? See, here, catch this. God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. God parted the Red Sea so his people could walk across. God delivered his people from famine time and time again. God blessed his people when other nations would look on and, and, and say, well, we want that. And, and God, and you, do you understand I could do this for hours? Because that is exactly what this is. This is a recounting of all of God's redemptive acts throughout history. You open right here, and God did something to save his people. Turn the page. God did something to save his people. Turn the page. God did a miracle, saved his people. Turn the page. God did something to save his people. And it's all in there time and time and time again of God's proven past and that's why we can have hope for a better future some of you would say I don't care Jimmy Old Testament stories don't do me any good what about it okay let's talk about you how about the fact that God gave you life before you were even able to ask for it how about the God, that God sent Jesus to die for your sins that you could be saved 2,000 years before you even knew you were going to be around how about that big time answer to prayer? Some of you have got one of these for every week, but, but everybody here has got at least one. You've got at least one. I mean, you may have to think all the way back to that algebra test in seventh grade. I don't know. But everybody's got that one time you go, yes, God, thank you for showing up. Oh, man, that was amazing. We've all got that big time answer to prayer. Think about the blessings in your life God has done. You see, God has shown up time and time again, and that is why our hope for a good future comes from God's proven past. You see, God has always been good to those who are called according to his purpose, to those who love him. God is good. And because we know God is good, we can know that God will be good again tomorrow. Except some of you would disagree with that. And I, I thank you for your politeness. Maybe it's just because we're in the South and you know not to throw things at people in church. And that's, that's kind of you. But see, some of you would say, Jimmy, my proven past with God, well, it's a little different. And some of you would ask the question, well, how can I be confident in God's proven past? Because what about the time God didn't? And you fill in the blank. We've got those two, don't we? See, here's the problem. The reason we struggle to have hope when we should is because we ha had hope when we shouldn't. And I know the grammar's not right, but it sticks in your head better. So let me say it again. The reason we struggle to have hope when we should is because we did have hope when we shouldn't. Let me explain. Psalm 33 is a beautiful picture of this. It says that the God of heaven looked down upon the children of man. Okay, God, you look down, you see us. What do you see? He says, I see the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. I see that the war horse is a false hope. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. A false hope? Yep. You see, what happens sometimes is we put our hopes in things that were false hopes, and then we were disappointed. Now we can't hope when we should because we hoped when we shouldn't. There are two 
false hopes that we have used in our lives more than anything else. The first one, war horses. Let me just make this practical. You see, for the king in this moment, his war horse was literally a war horse with a, a great warrior sitting on top of it. He looked and his army was there and everything he needed. And, and so he looks and he says, I've got great hope for our nation. I've got great hope for our victory in this battle. Look around us. My hope is great because look at my army. Look at my warriors. Man, look at those horses. We've got more than, than the other people. We've got stronger warriors. I've got great hope for the outcome. I guarantee you the king didn't even pray. Who needs to pray when you've got war horses? Matter of fact, that's how we do it. We get to a point where we look around and go, oops, my army's gone. My horses are dead. All we can do now is pray. See, for us, our hope in God only begins when we've lost hope in all of our war horses. Now, I'm going to give you just a couple of ideas of what war horses look like for humanity, but you're going to have to go and talk to God about your own. You, you're, you may have one that doesn't make my list, and even if I give you this, this little short list, uh, you, you may have one that rises to the top of it. You know, one of the first things that we have as a war horse is our own strength to endure. We come up in some tough life circumstances and we go, that's all right. I got hope this is going to be just fine because I've been through something tougher than like I can endure this. I can outlast this thing. This thing won't get me down. No, man, I've got this. Until you don't. And then you don't know what to do. Because your strength has always carried you through before and now suddenly your strength isn't enough. You find yourself at the end of it and you feel hopeless. Maybe your war horse has always been your ability and your knowledge to solve a problem. You've never met a problem yet that's got you, that you hadn't been able to get out of. You hadn't been able to work your way through. You hadn't been able to solve. Just a little ingenuity, a little thinking outside the box. I've got this. I can do this. Until you finally meet your match. And well, then you can't. And you find yourself hopeless. Maybe your war horse is your control. Come on, I know I just stepped on somebody's toes in this room. Oh, I got this. I'm just going to get all these people who made my life difficult under my control. I'm going to tell them what to do. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to get rid of them. I'm going to get you. Whatever I need to do, as soon as I get back in control, everything will be fine again. Until you realize that didn't fix it either. You know, the truth is some of our war horses are some very natural things. Like you get sick, your war horse is a doctor in medicine. I'm sick. I'll just call the doctor, get an appointment. They'll give me something. They'll take care of it. It's all good. I don't even need to pray. Matter of fact, we don't pray until the doctor says, I can't help you. God, I need hope. Because our hope was in our war horse and we don't have one. Maybe your war horse is in your money. You know how, how sometimes we just look at something. You have a problem and somebody says, oh, that ain't no problem at all. I can take care of that. We'll just hire this. We'll do that. We'll pay for that. We'll be right. And then someday your problem's bigger than your money. Maybe someday your problem's bigger than your friends. You know, a lot of us are war horses, our friends. Well, I'll just put my problem on Facebook. Suddenly I'll get a lot of likes, a little comments. I'll feel better about it. A couple of them will come over, have coffee with me. They'll, they'll sustain me. They'll carry me through. They'll encourage me. We've made war horses out of everything that we can come up with. And God says, that's a false hope. Because anything other than me. Our second one is wishes. We get false hope from our wishes. Look, we all have wishes. What I mean by that is we all, if we had a genie at our side, this is how our life would work out kind of thing, right? We've all got wishes. Look, I'm going to tell you all one that, that's kind of new. I never told anybody, and, except the Thursday service heard it first. Y'all come earlier, more seats, and you get the stories earlier. So there you go. But look, uh, when I was growing up, I ser seriously wished, like not just had the thought once, but I imagined in my mind this becoming a reality. And, and the wish was that my parents would suddenly become wealthy, like stinking wealthy. And, and I, I grew up watching Different Strokes. I had Different Strokes folks in the house. Come on, anybody with me from my era? Y'all know. For those of you that didn't raise your hand, you missed out on a really cool show uh, of these two brothers that, that, that lost their parents, or, or I actually forget the whole background of that part. But anyway, two brothers didn't have parents, and so this wealthy millionaire adopts them, and suddenly they live in a penthouse, and they ride everywhere in a limousine. And, and you know, so my dad was like working hard, like three jobs, and I got picked on at school. And I thought the amazing solution to both is if I ride up up to school and get out of a limousine like ain't nobody picking on me because if I have to I'll get the driver to come beat you up you know like yeah you ain't gonna mess I, I, and here's the thing I didn't just think about it once it wasn't like a dream one time I woke up from like I, I pictured this like I can picture the Cadillac 
limousine, black. I, I, you know, like we're talking like 1985, just for the record, so I can still see the car. I, I can see the school. I can see everything. This was a reality in my mind. I wished because I thought all my problems would go away. And we've all got wishes. Maybe for you, it's, it's a certain relationship. Man, if this will just work out when this works, if I get this relationship to go the way that it needs to go, then everything's going to be great. All my problems are going to work out. All my hope for my future is in this relationship. Maybe it's a, a certain job or a certain promotion. If you can just get that, everything will be fine. Young people, maybe it's a, a, a certain college lets you in or, or a certain person finally asks you out. It's all your hope because everything that seems like is wrong in your life will either be fixed or become so irrelevant at that point. Problem is wishes disappoint us too. And listen, here's the truth. I need y'all to hear this. Because here's the truth the devil absolutely does not ever want you to know. God has not failed you just because your wishes did not come true. Did y'all hear that? Because for some of us, we literally just got a new piece of theology. Like, that's going to change the way you live if you understand this. God has not failed you just because some of your wishes did not come true. Let's go back to that proverb I opened up with. It said that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Meaning hope that was unfulfilled. And here's the truth. Many of us have very sick hearts. Because we've had a lot of hopes in the wrong things, war horses and wishes. They didn't work out the way we wanted. Life has become a little tougher. Now we've lost the desire to hope. We've lost the belief that we can hope. We would describe our lives as hopeless. If you were here for part two, I, I touched on the mental health crisis that our world is facing right now because I said look if we can't preach things that are going to change how you live when you walk out this door I'm not sure what we're talking about like it needs to be practical to your life every day and right now one of the biggest things we're facing is a mental health crisis and as I told you last week I've got friends that work in that field professionals psychiatrists psychologists counselors all of them they would all agree with this statement that some at least some of our causes and cures are spiritual Meaning some of our causes and cures, the cures to the cause is what we're learning about right here with these words. In other words, Jesus came to give you something that is greater than the reality that you face. So let, let me make this, let me make sense of all this. We said that hope is waiting. Hope is trust. Hope is confidence. Hope is expectation. But when you don't have those four words, you have no hope. If your life is not characterized by those things. In other words, if somebody came along and they just started observing you, they said, hey, I want to write an article about you. I'm just going to follow you. Maybe somebody said, I want to just observe culture. I'm going to write an article on that. I don't think that they would, they would write down, man, this is a culture filled with people who wait patiently. No matter of fact, we've replaced waiting with worry. I don't think if they were observing, they'd say, look, I see a culture of people who trust. They trust God. No matter of fact, I think they'd write, I see a culture filled with fear. Because we've replaced trust with fear. I don't think they would write, I see a lot of confidence. I think they would say, I see a lot of anxiety. I don't think they'd write, I see a lot of expectation. I think they, they would write, I see a lot of despair. And if you'll let me play on words, if our culture and our individual lives are characterized by worry, fear, anxiety, and despair, then yes, your life is hopeless. Shouldn't be, because Jesus came to give us hope. Because Jesus is the reason that we know we can wait on God and his promises will be fulfilled. That because of his proven past, we can trust him for a good future. That because of who he is and he's always been, we can have confidence in him to continue to do that. And we can expect tomorrow to be an answer to prayer. We can have hope. Here's the problem. 
We put our hope in our war horses. They failed us. We put our hope in our wishes. They didn't come true. But what's really wrong with that is we didn't blame our war horses and our wishes. We blame God. God, why did you let this not work out? This relationship was going to change my life, God. God, why did you let this? God, why am I going through this? Why do I have to be sick like this? God, I was doing so well. God, why didn't I get the promotion? I was going to make this better for my family to be able to do things we've never done. God! We blame God for things He never promised to do. We blame God for where we put our hopes in the wrong things. And so, as we close today, I want to give you hope. I mean, like, real hope. Like what Jesus came to give you that is bigger than what you're going through. And I think the first thing that we have to do is question where we put our hopes in the wrong things so that we'll know how to put our hopes in the right things. So, real simply, if your false hope, if your lost hope came from wishes that didn't come true, you just need to go ahead and, and realize like, life is not a trip to Disney. All your wishes do not come true. If your lost hope has come from your war horses, then it is time that you recognize you can't do this on your own. You don't have enough stuff, you don't have enough friends, and you don't have enough strength. You need God. And if your hope, your lost hope, is because of something God didn't do, then let me encourage you to ask this question. When did God promise you he would? You see, God has promised us many, many things. And we can stand on promises. We can't stand on wishes. My wife and I were going through a difficult situation with one of our pregnancies, and the doctor told us that this pregnancy did not have any hope for a positive outcome outside of a miracle from God. But we believed our God is a miracle God, so we said, we, we, we've got hope for a miracle, we can do this, but I'm gonna be honest, waking up every single day and saying that to yourself was tough. And the further along we got and the more ultrasounds we went to that confirmed nothing had changed inside, the harder it was to hope for a miracle. I found myself having a conversation with my pastor at the time, saying, man, you gotta help me. I'm, I'm really struggling to, to have hope for a miracle and he said well what did God tell you he was going to do I thought excuse me I said yeah what did God tell you he was going to do did God tell you he was going to heal this child I don't know you need to put your hope in what God has said he'll do so what I know is God has promised very clearly in scripture he's a healer Y'all with me? So what I knew that I could put my hope in is God was going to heal. God was absolutely going to heal my child. What I did not know was God going to heal and we'd have many birthdays on earth or was God going to heal and we'd celebrate in heaven. Because sometimes healing is from a disease for a moment and sometimes healing is from a broken body and a broken world. And my trust was that God would do what was good for me, my wife, and my child because God causes all things to work out together for the good of those who love him. It's not always about an outcome. It's about the God who's in control of the outcome. Are you with me? So that's where our hope comes from. So let me bring it all together with this, this one verse. I've been waiting to do this for the whole series because it's the whole series in one verse. Check this out. It says... May the God of hope, and we'll pause there for a minute because here's what you need to know. God is our source of hope, and he's also our object of hope, meaning that we put our hope in him because he's the one that gives us reason to have hope in the first place. He is the God of hope, both directions. Did y'all get that? May the God of hope, meaning internal confidence. May the God of hope fill you with all joy internal happiness despite external circumstances fill you with 
peace, internal calmness despite external circumstances, in believing, which is faith, which we're going to close out the series next week, internal conviction despite what you see. May the God who gives you hope and joy and faith and peace bring it all together, and don't miss this last part, so that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And see, here's what we really miss sometimes. Because we think that when you throw in the Holy Spirit stuff, that that's just like a good way to sign off a verse or something. Like, in Jesus' name, in the power of the Holy Spirit, something like that. But let me help you with a little bit of theology that I hope will change your life. He's talking about through the Holy Spirit, inside of us. When we become a believer in Jesus, God puts His Spirit to dwell inside of us. So we don't have to talk about a God in heaven. Yes, there is a God in heaven. There's a God everywhere. But that God is right here. God's right here inside of me. And so he says, so through the power of the Holy Spirit, meaning you're not alone in these difficult circumstances that you're trying to, to have hope in the midst of. God's with you. He's right there. He knows your angst. He knows your fears. He knows your worries. And he's trying to give you confidence and trust and expectation because he's not just saying, I'm up in heaven and I might catch it. Just, I might see it. No, he's saying, I'm right here with you. I know every moment of it. I know what you're going through. And here's the point. That if we understand he's right inside of us, then hope comes from a relational experience, not a religious exercise. See, if your idea of God is just that big thing up on the throne that you read about in the Old Testament and, and you just hope he's nice to you when you get there someday, then trying to have hope in that is a religious exercise. Let me read a Bible story. Let me see if I can put myself there. Let me hope that I can have hope. You can't have hope on your own. That's why you need the Holy Spirit to give you hope. See, hope comes from your everyday conversation. Hope comes from walking through something and knowing God's there with you. Hope comes through hearing his voice. Hope comes through the relational experience you have with him that says, God, I know that you're not going to abandon me because you're with me right now. You've always been here. You always will be. And you came to do good Amen. right here in my life today. That is where my hope comes from. It's where my hope comes from. God in me. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that you are here, that you did not leave us alone, that you did not leave us to figure out how to put a smile on our face in tough things, but, but you came to make some things real. You made peace real no matter what we're facing. You made joy real no matter what we're facing. And God, today you give us hope in who you are, period. You give us hope in who you are, who you've always been, knowing that you will continue to be good to your people, to me, to every one of us. God, today we confess we've put our hope in our war horses and wishes. God, forgive us. And today will you, will you cause us to be people who put our hope in you alone. If you're just staying in a place of prayer, I want to speak to those of you that have yet to make Jesus your king. And well, you may feel like you have no hope. And well, the simple truth is you don't. Because everything I've talked about today comes through Jesus Christ. The hope that God promises to those who are called according to his purpose, what that means is those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus. Hope peace, joy, everything that Jesus is offering us comes through that relationship with him. Knowing that you are forgiven and have eternal life all through Jesus. So if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to help you do that right now, wherever you are, online or here in the room. Simply say something like this to yourself and to God. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. And so now, I choose to live for you. I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that I'm forgiven. In my simple prayer here today, will you fill me with your spirit that I may abound in hope and will get you give me a life of great meaning in your kingdom. Amen. Will everybody help me celebrate with those people? Amen.